Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews Toronto Mayoral One on One Series, where we bring you exclusive conversations with the candidates vying for the prestigious position of Toronto Mayor. Today, we have a special guest joining us, someone who is not only being dedicated to serving this great city, but is also accompanied by a furry friend who has captured the hearts of many Torontonians. With 102 candidates vying for the position of Toronto mayor, we want to cut through the spin and sit down with the candidates who are running for the position of mayor. Today, we welcome Toby Heaps, the candidate for the position of Toronto mayor, and his loyal companion, Molly. Toby, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Pleasure. And uh, Molly's just having your siesta then. Molly, want to say hi to Chris? <laughs> <laughs> Too exhausted campaigning, I guess. Um, yeah. Toby, I want to start with the first big question that I think is on a lot of people's minds. What inspired you to get involved in this campaign and run for the position of mayor? Well, I've spent, um, I come from a long line of rabble rousers, uh, in my, my family sort of tracing back to my great grandfather, who was one of the leaders of the Winnipeg general strike and was elected to the house of the commons as a labor MP and helped to institute old age pension and unemployment insurance. And so there's always been a high bar in my family about respecting justice and questioning authority. And I spent my career at corporate nights uh, working with some of the world's largest companies and, and governments to challenge them and, and wrangle with them to uh, to get them to be more sustainable and to get in place the, the conditions necessary for the economy to function in a way that is consistent with what our planet and uh, can take and what our, what our people need. And so in Toronto, it's my home base. I'm from Calgary originally, but I've lived here for over 20 years. And I've grown to love the city. I've got two young boys. I've got I had my dog Molly, who I inherited from my mom when um, when she passed away a couple of years ago. And uh, the last couple of years, uh, it's 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 uh, it's really. I, I knew I was going to get in the public arena at some point. And I think about two years ago, after the Build Back Better stuff happened, there was post pandemic. We did a lot of work with some of the leading Canadians from all sectors to come up with a, a Build Back Better plan that would be a real public investment to really turbocharge our clean economy and create hundreds of thousands of jobs and get us on track to meet the climate change commitments and address the climate emergency in, in, a, in a serious way so we could walk the talk. And we, I, myself and Corporate Nights, we organized, which is the company that I co-founded and I'm CEO of, we organized uh, over 40 of Canada's leading CEOs from across sectors, financial institutions, Suncor, tech resources, like big multi-billion dollar companies for, for the first time to come together and really back a significant kind of public investment um, in, in, in the green economy. And uh, we had talks with Ottawa, with the cabinet and the Trudeau government. And uh, I really thought that they were going to go for it. We had it costed out and it was it paid back. It was fiscally responsible, hundreds of thousands of jobs. And as, 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 it, as usually happens with sort of big governments in Canada, especially with mainstream parties and, and career politicians, they adopted this sort of quarter solution. And uh, they created an $8 billion net zero accelerator to accelerate green businesses which was about a quarter as much as was needed, sprinkled it, you know, spread the peanut butter really thin, so it's not going to be much good anywhere. And it, it really started to kind of bug me because I was thinking, we we're running out of time and we the solutions are on the shelf. We have the money and we're not doing nearly what we could or what just makes sense. It's not about radical. Um, it's just about what makes sense for jobs and for competitiveness and, and the emergency. And so I, I decided at that point to get in sooner than later into the arena, probably in the next three or four years when my kids were older. But this last two winters, the uh, the oh, salt, man. yeah, the salt on the road. Toronto uses one of the most toxic combos of, of salt to to keep the roads safe when there are other alternative, safer, cost effective alternatives. And they just they just pour it on the streets like recklessly, and it it it, it, it killed the gardener, which is a two billion dollar infrastructure thing, one hundred thousand people wreaking havoc with one hundred thousand people per day, and it was causing chemical burns on Molly's paws. And I tried to get those little booties on her, she just you know she wouldn't have it. And we go running every morning. And so I started doing some research. And when I figured out just how ludicrous it was for the city to be doing this, when it would cost literally pennies on the dollar, um, you know, like a couple to, a couple toonies per resident to get the good solution, get better solution, 80% less harmful, the one that Calgary is using. And we were we were we were sort of pig-headedly going ahead and using this solution. Um, it really started to um, kind of stick in my crock because I had to deal with this pain and suffering. And, and thinking about how crazy it was, how my tax law were funding this, how the lakes were suffering, how people were replacing their cars two years earlier that were rusted out, people with shoes having to replace them. And it was just kind of, it was a bit of a symbol for the insanity that prevails in our institutional political structures today, just like the complete disconnect from reality. 
Um, and then uh, the decision moment to run, uh, Molly and I were running at Ontario Place, beautiful public space right on the lake. Been open, I've been going there since I was a kid when I would come to visit my dad here. We were running and uh, that morning on CBC, the premier, Doug Ford, was talking about how he was going to privatize Ontario Place to for this Scandinavian company to create a, a, a spa for millionaires and this massive parking lot. And it was going to put fences up and gates at Ontario Place and, and shut us out. And we were running Ontario Place and I was thinking about it and we were looking back at the city, the beautiful skyline, the CN Tower, the Sky Dome. And, and I looked at Molly and I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could be there? And then I started thinking about it. I was like, okay, well, you know, practicalities, you know, the, those eligibility requirements, you have to be 18 years and they don't count dog years, right? So even though she's 46 <laughs> dog years, she's only, you know, considered to be almost 70 human. And then I started running back and I thought, well, wait a minute, I could run. I mean, I'm like, I, I've run a presidential campaign in the U.S. I ran a company, worked with many of the world's largest multinationals, designed programs to the federal and provincial government and got support and mobilized billions of dollars, real things that I've done. And uh, and I knew I was going to get involved. I thought, well, you know, if not now, then when? How often do you have a by-election? The answer is, this is the first time ever in this history of Toronto Mega City, 102 people running. At that point, it wasn't 102. And then I thought, well, wait, maybe it's over, right? Because the election's coming up. Maybe it's, this is May, mid-May. And uh, so I looked at, on the phone and said, well, no, um, I've got three, I got a few days until registration closes. And I didn't really, so then I started talk, thinking about it. And it was such a crazy idea, like to, to initiate a mayoral campaign. Like I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm kind of like a bit of a crap bit of a credible serious person in Toronto, just to like out of the, out of the, out of left field. And uh, so I talked it over with my youngest son or my oldest son, Zia, he's, he's seven, at the time he was six. And I said, so here's what I'm thinking. What do you think? And he said, well, go for it. And I said, well, you know, if we, if we go for it, we're going to go all in, put everything we have, it'll be over a month and we might not win. And how will you feel then? And he said, well, I'd be mad, I'd be sad, I'd be happy you tried. So that was good enough for me. And uh, and now we're, we're, here we are. Cool. There's a lot to unpack there, but I want to stick to the Toronto in the Toronto uh, mayoral elect by election in general here for a few minutes, because you're right. You have a month left and there are a variety of issues that are facing the city of Toronto today. Uh, climate change, housing, affordability, transportation. Um, how do you address these? Because this, while Toronto is a municipality, I, I recently spoke to someone who said that Toronto is basically a province within a province, right? You have the ear of the premier, you have the ear of the prime minister when issues come arise. So how do you plan to address the issues? Because you talk about how Doug Ford sort of just went against the grain and sold uh, Ontario Place. But at the same time, you have to address the issues that are going to be uh, prominent to the people of Toronto, are you going to be going out and talking to them? Are you going to be addressing them one-on-one? -on -one? How do you envision yourself addressing the key challenges facing your community? Sure. So, I mean, it's a really good question. And um, it's something I've been thinking about uh, for a lot of the last couple of decades. I've watched uh, people with good intentions get into politics and not get much done. <laughs> and generally, there's, there's, a, there's a few things that happen. You know, it's before you get into politics, you have to have some accomplishments under your belt. You have to know concrete things that you really want to do and be able to hit the ground running. So if you don't get it done in the first 100 days, you spend a lot of the rest of the time reacting. You really have to have your sort of agenda set up before you get in. And then you need to be able to figure out how you're going to stand up to the special interests. Because if you're changing something for the better, you're going to be, you're going to be hitting some brick walls. And those folks are sophisticated and they're wealthy and they have resources and been running the country for a long, long time. And they know what they're doing. And they're also really adept I sort of getting in there, making you think that they're your friend. I know because I know many of these people, some of them I would call friends. And most of them are not bad people. It's just where you sit is where you stand. And often also, and I've seen this happen with other mayors who are my friends, you know, Gregor Robertson, Don Iveson, Nahid. And you see, you can get steered into ditches um, where you think you're doing something, but there's just the bureaucrats and the, 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 the people that are part of the system steer it somewhere. And then you end up doing a report, makes a committee, the next, direct, next thing you know, it's the next election, nothing's happened. Um, or, you know, in the case of the prime minister, you get a carbon tax, you're going to make polluters pay. And then somebody writes a nice little uh, footnote that there's an intensity based allocation. And all of a sudden, the biggest oil companies in the country don't pay any carbon tax. Nobody notices. So the whole point of the carbon tax kind of goes by the wayside for the biggest polluters. So this stuff happens all the time. And sometimes there'll be an air game 
where if you do something really disruptive, you'll, you'll get attacked by the people that are being impacted that that are, are stand to lose some some of their profits. You know, Gregor Robson, great great example. He didn't maybe move fast enough in his first first time in office, first part of office to um, to crack down and really enforce affordability for new new housing developments. And when he did move to do that in his latter term, he um, there was a sort of a ground campaign, Cambridge Analytica style, that came against him and didn't attack him for being pro affordability or anti development, but attacked him for being a sellout to developers when he was doing exactly the same, the opposite. And they knew where to hit, where it hurt. So you have to be ready for all these things. But all that said, before you say anything, why would anyone pay any attention to any politician saying anything these days when words words can become worthless? You say you can make a promise and break it, and there's no accountability. And so for me, for my campaign, I pledged to make every donation public, who, who made it and how much, before the, before the uh, general election day. Um, I have a contract with Toronto that stipulates, and we'll, we'll go through the areas that stipulates what I will do in the first 100 days, or if I'm found not to have done it by the independent auditor, I will resign. And I'm going to challenge all the other candidates to back up their words with, with similar convictions. And so that, that sort of sets the context. So let's step back a bit and say, okay, what's what's the situation here in Toronto? You're talking about affordability trends and all these. So if we want to summarize it, this is what's going on in our city. It's It's a gorgeous city. It's, it's the second most multicultural place in the world. It's the fourth largest city in, in North America. It's an engine, an economic engine of Canada, you know, upwards, upwards of fifth of the economy. But we are stuck in traffic. A lot of people are afraid to ride the subway. Almost nobody can afford to buy a home. I can't buy a home. It's a successful entrepreneur and a six-figure income. I cannot afford to buy a home in my kid, the neighborhood where my kids go to public school in Parkdale. People are worried about the climate emergency. We have floods, we're hearing about fires, we have all these promises, things being said, not happening. And people are generally feeling a bit down and out, whether it's after effects of COVID or all the other things, cell phones, but mental health um, is on the decline and people are feeling uh, depressed. A lot of people uh, have had enough. I am one of those people. And um, uh, while I'm, uh, I'm a successful entrepreneur, my whole life, I've been an underdog, and that's my identity, and and that's 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 how I orientate. And my my running mate Molly is an underdog as well, and uh, we want to we want we've been fighting. I've been fighting for underdogs my whole life, and and uh, and, and I want to I want to take that fight um, with the full power of the city. And so if you think, okay, we're stuck in traffic, so the Gardner Expressway transit not happening. Why is this happening? The Gardner Expressway is getting torn down right now, getting repaired. Uh, more than 10 years sooner than it should have been because it's been corroded by the toxic salt that we have poured on there. So that's a known goal. That's an, that's self-inflicted. That's that, those 100,000 people who are having havoc wreaked on them each day in our commute. That's salt. That's been well-documented in the Toronto Star. Public transit, taking forever. It takes longer to build a subway line than it did to put a man on the moon in Toronto. I'm not joking. Why does this happen? Nobody is incentivized. Nobody has upside. So people take, you know, they don't want to take risk. I'm talking about senior city staff who could really kind of grab, grab the ball and, and, and run a little faster. So I would introduce performance bonuses up to 25% base that would be specifically tied to time targets. And for city senior city staff who could make major infrastructure projects happen faster, and, and those timelines would be set aggressively, not just easy ones to hit, they would then get some upside. So if you have some upside, you have some motivation. I've seen in the private sector that works really effectively. People are afraid to ride on the subway. There's violence on the subway. The solution is not to put more men and women in blue. Those guys are expensive. We need them on, on the streets dealing with, with, with real things. But we can have nice TPC ambassadors who are well-trained to be cordial and not intimidating, but just to, to give a, give a you know, if there's somebody there in the car, um, it's it, it makes it a safer area. And it's way more cost-effective than we're doing right now for the city. Like Police officers make... Up, way upwards of uh, after the first year, one hundred thousand dollars per year plus their car benefits and all the costs that are associated. TTC ambassadors would be a much more cost-effective, more fit-for-purpose solution. Also, we have this issue: you can't afford to buy a home. Now, the developers have been running the city for a long time for their own special interests. And if you were looking at the city from the Martians' perspective, you would say, okay, so the developers are basically there, and the city council is there to serve the developers. That's kind of how this thing works. You know, all these condos popping up. We have a lot of public land, um, over over 150,000 units of uh, housing units, 
could be built on the public land that Toronto, city of Toronto now controls. And I'm talking about the province and federal government. It's even more when you count those, those ones in. If we were to introduce a cooperative housing, not rental, not rental, no, ownership model, um, we could be building new homes for people uh, at, this, at, at the scale of 25,000 affordable homes per year. Now, let me put that in context. In the last six years, the city of Toronto has built about 250 affordable homes per year. So, no. in, with, yeah, within the city of Toronto. That's it again, Toronto Star Source article from the housing report from the city of Toronto. So they said uh, 1,600 affordable homes have been built in the city of Toronto in the last six years. That's 1% of what we need to be doing. It's not half, it's not a quarter, it's 1%. It's pathetic and it's unacceptable. And we have cost-effective financial solutions to be able to go tackle this with cooperative home ownership models where the city would take those the lands where we have 150,000 units. And I would add into that user or loser provisions for developers who are sitting on properties where they're not building right now. So then we could probably double that to, to close to 300,000 units, but certainly 150,000. We could introduce, we could prioritize that for 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 cooperative home ownership models, and in those models, um, we uh, which we've been working on with Mike Labbe, who's a, sort of a pioneer in this space, and we'll be showing the policy uh, later this week. Um, those policies, somebody earning as little as thirty five thousand dollars per year with a five hundred dollar deposit, could get into the home ownership market in Toronto. The numbers I'll check out. My background is finance. I'm not inventing this model. This is the model that has been refined over 40 years by people like Mike Labbe from Options for Homes and, and Chris Stevenson from the Cooperative Housing Movement. And we will take this and we will not take no for an answer. We will not listen to developers. We will get this fast track. You can do that. The city has the, the provision to ask the province to fast track. We will fast track anything that is cooperative home ownership models and we will prioritize city lands to go to them. And we will aim to get to that 25,000 new units of affordable housing coming online within five years. And within the first 18 months, we will aim to get 10,000 um, with shovels in the ground, not 250 per year, which is pathetic. And so many people I, running for mayor. Yeah. I'm going to challenge you here for a second, uh, Toby, if that's okay. Challenge because uh, because yeah. you, you, you openly admit it that sometimes politicians get in for good reasons and then they go against what they've ran on. How can people believe what you're saying? How do people put their trust in you? Because I think that's the big thing that a lot of people yeah. – talk about is I don't trust politicians and anyone who runs for politics, as much as they don't want to be called a politician, yeah. you're a politician, you're running for that job. How do people, if Toronto, how do the Torontonians who are listening to this right now say, I like what Toby's saying, but how am I, how am I going to believe that he's going to go against the developers? He's going to get this uh, uh, percentage of affordable housing uh, done within the time frame, within that first hundred days, as yeah. you say, because yeah. past is past and the future is yeah. something else so how do we believe yeah. what you're saying toby so i, I think that's a really good question because i often have a similar reaction when i hear people talking <laughs> like I, was, I was looking at barack obama's 2008 speech all the things he promised to do and then kind of to, you know comparing that to what happened and it was like so you can look at my track record i didn't come out of nowhere for the last 21 years i have a track record of getting big things done things that people did not think were possible I have to find a new standard for, for doing business in a sustainable way that many of the world's largest corporations are, are, are now adhering to. And if you want to look at like who, who trusts me, because that's how I try to make up my, my, my own too. Um, I was Ralph Nader's campaign manager. Um, Ralph Nader um, is, a, is a big supporter. He's been a mentor for me my whole life. And uh, he's been uh, one of the more transformational figures from putting seatbelts in cars to just about every piece of progressive legislation that was enacted in the United States between the 60s to, to 2000. Um, he, he, he trusts me. Uh, he, he's going to come out with a public endorsement later on in the campaign. We can go around other former mayors, um, but you have Ralph Nader and you have the King of England. The King of England wanted to make a new award to give to the most sustainable corporations in the world. And he did, he's, he's been on this sort of organic climate change environmental thing for 40 years. He's not a, not a Johnny come lately. And there were a lot of firms out there, multi-billion dollar research firms that specialize in rating companies on sustainability. Corporate Knights is you know, a relatively small one. Uh, we're based in Canada. You know, we're 20 people. And he handpicked, handpicked me to be his primary advisor to oversee the process and make recommendations on which companies would get his terror, terror card to seal. Uh, he could have picked anybody in the world and he picked me because he knew he could trust me not to give the BS and to cut through the greenwash um, because he knows that's my track record. So if you um, if you think the King of England 
or Ralph Nader know anything about character, um, I've got some pretty good references. Okay. No, and I apologize for asking that question. It's just no, no, no. You, you were talking, and I, I felt the passion that you had while you were uh, speaking about the issues, and I was like, okay, I believe you. But you literally put the words in your own mouth of saying sometimes you just can't uh, believe what people are going to run on and then govern on. I, I I want to talk about that first hundred days in office, though, because you mentioned it. And I want to dive a little bit deeper into it because you said within the first hundred days, you're going to ask the auditor to look if you've accomplished what you haven't accomplished, or if you haven't accomplished what you haven't accomplished, you will resign. Why is that important to you? Because I've heard that from some people who I believe, and I believe that they have the follow through to say, if I don't get what I want accomplished, but you have to realize that municipal government does not change overnight. Like you can get in there and there are people behind the scenes in administration and there's probably some really great people in administration, but how do you, how do you, what confidence do you have in yourself that you can get it done within that first hundred days to start seeing that progress progress that you are hoping yeah. for? So I've been, I've been pretty busy the last, since I announced um, just getting all the legal things lined up about what we're allowed to do as a city and everything and what you can make a motion for, request a report, initiate, do an appointment, uh, propose a budget, you know, looking at all the powers the mayor has under the various legislations. And so just to be very, just to be crystal clear, I'm not proposing to solve all of those issues that we talked about in the first 100 days. I'm proposing to make concrete actions that are defined in a contract. Some of the, some, in some cases, it'll be requesting a staff report to report back within 60 days on how can, on how Toronto can move forward at a clip of 25,000 affordable homes per year within a community, within a cooperative home ownership model. And then that will be voted on by council. So that will be the act, the, the act I'll take in the first 100 days will be requesting that report. And then we'll put it to, to council to, to, to vote on that, to implement it. And then that would be prioritizing, the vote would be to prioritize the city owned land to go towards that purpose. Usually when staff reports are requested, specific things like the amount of days are not are not there. Sometimes they can take, I, I know I've been involved, they can take nine months or 12 months. And uh, I would be asking for this report within 60, 60 days. And um, we have other things. So let's talk about equitable. Uh, we have a billion point five uh, budget shortfall uh, hole in the budget in Toronto. And uh, you have candidates talking about solutions. Uh, Doug Ford is going to fill it for them. You know, trust, trust them. They're not going to take no for an answer. Um, or we're going to cut a billion dollars. Don't ask me where, you know, after the election, you can find out. So this is the kind of silly stuff that we're, we're, we're hearing, but it's really interesting if you look, because my background is finance. And if you look, you have to follow the money. Like when Willie Loman was asked, uh, Willie Sutton was asked, why do you rob the banks? I said, well, that's where the money is. And so I'm not talking about robbing the rich. Many of my friends are the rich. Um, I know these people, whatever, I play tennis with these people. They're not bad people. They don't wake up in the morning th thinking, how can I screw the average person? But they're creatures of a system, and a lot of them would feel better if our city was thriving, was not stuck in traffic, had more public spaces, recreation centers, uh, there wasn't the mental health crisis. They wouldn't mind paying their fair share if it was fair, like if it wasn't just them singled out, but if it was, you know, like, you know, every, you know a defined, it wasn't just randomly sort of picking out a company or a person. And so the two places, if you want to make money for the city of Toronto, where there's real money, is a mansion tax. So... The city has graduated uh, property tax uh, arrangements right now in the commercial property class, not in the residential. Um, and so there's there's some legal gray area as to whether or not you'd need permission from the province or you could proceed and sort of beg for permission or or push for permission later with a whole groundswell of people converging on Queen's Park and uh, and even if we had to, to go to Doug Ford's neighborhood. But it's also interesting if you look back to 1906 when property tax was first initiated in the city of Toronto, it was on income-based um, income based scale. So there is a legal precedent. Um, and I've been working with the people of the province of Ontario who are responsible for, 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 for enforcing the City of Toronto Act and for overseeing the property tax. So I'm, not, I'm going to the people that are the gold standard for information to figure out what we're allowed to do. And my best advice that I've been given is that, yes, it would be possible to proceed with a proposed budget measure, properly crafted, that would set up a new... Um, uh, higher uh, property tax, I'm talking annual property tax, of starting at 0.5% for homes valued greater than what Doug Ford's home sold for. So his, I mean, it would be mansion tax, but his his home sold for 2.7 million. And if you look at the number of homes in the city, it's 47,000 that are valued about, by, by our estimates over two, over over three point, over three 2.7 million, average price is 3.5 million. You put a 0.5% uh, tax on those homes, 
without even scaling it up, you know, you can scale it up after the 5 million, but just on that, that's bringing in $800 million a year. It's real money, $800 million a year. It's not this 20 million or 30 million foot, you know, little crumbs that people are talking about with license fees and user fees that piss everyone off. It's real money. Obviously, we would give exemptions, not exemptions, but deferrals for people on fixed income. So the, the mansion tax would be paid on the point of sale. But this is where the real money is. It's in the mansions. And it's actually quite fair because you think when you get paid a salary, you have to pay tax on 100% of what you made, whatever the marginal rate is. So they can't. They look at every dollar you made and they tax it at the marginal rate. When you have a $5 million house that appreciates to $10 million, you don't get taxed one penny on it, not one penny. So it's not fair. And those, those folks are prospering the most from the city. And I think they would feel better, feel better if they could, you know, pay their fair share to help the city operate. The other thing I wanted to do, and again, this is, it's not a complete black and white, but it's gray area. And I think gray area, if you're on the, on the, on the side of the angels um, and you're filling a budget hole that would otherwise have to co come from Doug Ford's pocket, I think you, we, we could get this. There's a graduated property tax for the commercial, uh, commercial, commercial businesses. And what I would like to do is the biggest companies, the billion dollar companies, the Royal Banks, the Loblaws, whose CEOs make over a hundred times what their average worker makes. And there are cities in, 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 in the US and Oregon and California, uh, including San Francisco, that have these CEO to average worker um, pay kind of, uh, they call them overpaid CEO taxes. I would like to go and charge those guys double what the property taxes that they're paying right now. So specify that graduated rate, which they're already subject to in the commercial basis with the new definition for entities that have over a billion dollars annual revenue at the ultimate parent level and pay their CEO 100 times more than the average worker, those folks are going to be taxed at double the rate for the current rate. So by my, our calculations, this generates real money. We're talking north of a billion dollars for the city. doesn't fill the whole hole necessarily. But then I would go to DOFO, and we wouldn't be, we're not demonizing the business sector. I'm pro-business. I want to create 100,000 green jobs in Toronto in the next few years, new ones. But we would go, go into the same business sector and say, look, there's still a budget shortfall. We need to fill it in. Toronto is Canada's economic engine. We cannot allow the premier or the or the prime minister to shortchange our engine. And I would organize the business community just as I have in my career at Corporate Nights because I don't have leverages in the mayor. The, the premier doesn't care about the mayor. The mayor is a, is a legal creature, subsidiary of the premier. But if I can go with his donors and the people who have influenced him from Bay Street and from the big employers in, in, in the province, then I have leverage. And I'm good at that. You talk about the Toronto being the economic engine, uh, one of the economic engines of Canada. The economy and job creation are vital to the prosperity of Toronto. So I want to keep on that topic here for a second. How do you plan to foster economic growth and attract investment to the city while ensuring equitable opportunities for all residents that they are able to afford those houses? They are able to uh, feel safe in their own homes while businesses are investing and businesses are coming to their communities. Yeah. So this is really interesting. And and uh, I talked to Gregor Robertson is a good friend of mine from Mayor Vancouver. And, uh, you know, he, he had a similar model, green entrepreneur there. Now he's back into the green building sector. And he said, you know, one of the mistakes they made is in Vancouver, they were so darn successful at attracting new businesses, green businesses and tech businesses to invest in the city. That it just skyrocketed property prices and it and it kind of and it, and it torpedoed their um their affordable housing agenda because you know housing prices went like this and so i think the way you get around that is you don't play footsie with the developers from day one you move expeditiously to prioritize all the city lands so you can be using the private folks or contractors to build to build the the, the, the affordable housing um, but you're building it at scale. So we're talking like tens of thousands of units, getting up to 25,000 units per year. And these these are set up in cooperative homeownership models. And so that helps to keep the things affordable. The other question is, you want small businesses to be able to operate. So if you have property taxes, you have property values skyrocketing, commercial values, and you're a small business like Chocolate Soul or Mad Mexican, uh, two of my best friends that operate to the tastiest food companies here. One's chocolate, it's horizontal trade, Chocolate Soul. If you ever you know, the cherry one is really good, and the Jaguar, the Albino for Calvin is amazing. And the Mad Mexicans, like the Champagne and Guacamole's, uh, both of these guys self made, um, uh, the employing like you know, upwards of uh, 50 people uh, each. Their property tax and uh, bites. And so, in, in my in my model, where we take the billion dollar entities, so it could be that would be the Shopify, so it would be the rural banks, these entities that are the, the IBMs, these entities would be paying closer to their fair share. And because they have such high margins, um, it would, it would, they have the capacity to do it 
and um, and also that the margins are a function of the, of their home base of Toronto and uh, and all the prosperity they're able to generate from their home base because you know you don't create you don't create you can't make profit in anarchy you make profit in civilization and so these folks who pay their fair share and that would take some of the stress off having to raise the rates of the small business property tax. I would also use the city's $3.1 billion procurement budget, which is not being used in any kind of intentional way right now, to prioritize um, spending with uh, with Black-owned and minority-owned businesses and with small businesses, with B corporations, and with, with Toronto-located small businesses with less than a, with 100 people, and also, also women-owned businesses. Right now, there is, there is, there is not a systematic use of that $3.1 billion per year, um, which could be an amazing uh, way to catapult some of our smaller businesses from those sort of market stalls into the 100, 200 employer kind of space. And uh, I've seen the power of procurement in the corporate world. You can do beautiful things and you can you can really turbocharge beautiful things if you can focus it. I have one last question before we wrap up here, Toby, and it's about climate change because it seems like you're a passionate person about this issue and it is a global issue, but cities are playing a crucial role in combating climate yeah. change. What measures besides the salt issue that we talked about earlier on in the interview about road salt in the wintertime, what measures will you implement to make Toronto a greener and more sustainable city for the future? Well, the big thing here is um, if you look at where the greenhouse gases come from Toronto, it's from cars and from burning gas to tea homes. That, that's where the greenhouse gases are coming from Toronto. We don't have big smokestacks here anymore. So in the gas piece, uh, right now, there's a lot of people, there's renovations galore happening in Toronto, galore. They take usually many months to get approved. It's a bane, it sticks in the craw of people. I would create a new unit of people uh, called a fast track green SWAT team within the city of Toronto. And if you wanted to do any kind of renovation, you would get fast track 30 day guaranteed decision, but it would have to be green. And one of the green requirements would be, you would have to be putting in a heat pump um, to replace the, the furnace. And so that would turbocharge. Last year in Canada, we had more heat pumps installed in furnaces. So this is like, this is a huge thing that's already happening. We have a cover story coming out with the Toronto Star and Corporate Nights, a huge feature looking at the potential for scaling up heat pumps to replace all the, almost all the furnaces in the country over the, over the course of this decade. Um, and it, it's 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 cost effective um, at the current price you have for heat pumps. It works up to minus forty degrees Celsius. It's just a common sense solution, and there's a reason why it's already more popular this year to install a heat pump than it is to install a furnace. But we could turbocharge this, and this is a huge piece of our emissions. Now we get to the cars. We have cars on the road not because people want to be stuck in traffic or want to drive. It's a waste of time for a lot of people, but because a lot of people feel afraid to jump on their bike or their scooter or their other, because we have incomplete biking infrastructure, which really just pisses off everybody because <laughs> not that many people use it and then it gets in the way. So let's close the loop. Let's not try to do the Grand Canyon on Pogo stick. Let's, let's get this done in one fell swoop and integrate a systemic network, take some of the load and pressure off of the, off of the car, car waste. So some of those people will be getting in bikes, not all of them by any measure, but some of those people. And then let's get our transit infrastructure moving. If not, accept, not acceptable, take longer to fi finish the Craig Eglinton Crosstown than it did to put a man on the moon after JFK made his um, his speech um, in uh, in the 60s. Um, so we can we can move on that. Um, and and the way to move on that is we need to we need to uh, give incentives to senior city staff so that they have upside because as a mayor or as a council, we're really not involved in the operations. We have some oversight, but there's senior city staff that did, do know what's going on. And if they're incentivized, they're willing to take some risk for some upside. And as politicians, we need to own the risk. We need to tell the civil servants, if if there's a screw up, if there's egg on the face, it's egg on my face, I will own that screw up. Um, it's not, it's not, that's not, that's not on you, it's on me. But you go take the risks, you get the upside. I'm the political leader setting setting this up, and we will we will we will we will we will pay the price for for any uh, any mistakes that are made. So I, I have one last question for you, and it's the big one. And take as long as you want to answer this or as short as yeah. amount of time. Um, give us your pitch. Talk to the people. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> give us your pitch. Why should you be the next mayor of the city of Toronto? Uh, well, I want to I want to create a, a kinder city for um, for my kids, for our dog, and for all of us to thrive. Um, I've lived here for over 20 years. I'm planning to, to live here for, for uh, another 20 years. And uh, this city could be so, so awesome. It could, and um, and we're, we're stuck in traffic and I want to get it moving. I've got the track record to do it. And uh, <laughs> these, these guys are really effective campaigners, by the way. You should see them handing out flyers. Um, 
And uh, I know the folks that are running, other 101 folks running, most of them are well-intentioned, good people. Um, I don't think any of them are big departures from business as usual. I don't think any of them have spent their whole life fighting for underdogs. And uh, we're going to fight for the underdogs. And uh, we're going to give the establishment a run for their money. And we will never roll over for the establishment. So, so I've got to ask the your son here, why should people vote for your dad? Just stinky. <laughs> okay. Uh, I thought he was going to say, be- say Steve was stinky. <laughs> <laughs> how can people find out more about yourself and follow uh, your campaign and potentially make a donation, get a sign, or learn more about you, uh, Toby? Sure. Uh, our our website's Toby Molly for Mayor. Dot .ca and that's number 4 Toby Molly for mayor.ca Molly's L L Y Toby Molly for mayor.ca The link to that will be in the show notes. I want to thank you so much uh, Toby for joining us for a special episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Uh it's been a great pleasure to learn about yourself and learn about your campaign and we'll be watching you for the next 20 Four days now. I'm just trying to remember what day it is. Or 23 22. days. 22, 22 days. 22 yeah, yeah. days until Lots the next one. Yeah. Um, and to our viewers, thank you for tuning in and being part of the conversation. Finally, as much as we love our phones and technology, let's remember to put them down and have real life in person conversations, even if it's just for five minutes a day. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time on the cross border interviews. Until then, just keep talking. <laughs>